So what? Yeah, what have we got here then? What's this? Oh, I've been gag- play, playing around with this. Quite fun. Uh, I borrowed this from our robot lab. This is an Intel RealSense, which is a, a kind of all-in-one depth sensor. Right. So I thought we'd just talk about what it is and why might we want depth. In the vision literature, which is sort of where I am, we would usually term this RGBD, right, which is red, green, and blue, and also depth. Right. Now depth is kind of like 3D in the sense that you know where things are in in a scene, but actually really you just know how far they are away from the camera, which is not as good as 3D because of course you don't know what's behind those things, but it's better perhaps than just RGB because it allows you to, for example, separate objects much, much more easily. Quite a lot of research is going on in RGBD just in general because it makes a lot of problems slightly easier or more powerful. You know, deep learning applied to RGBD is traditionally going to be a bit better performing than just RGB because the network doesn't have to make that effort to separate where the object boundaries are. You could just find the thing that's closest and do that, right? That it would theoretically make it easier. Now, actually, I don't do a lot of real sense only because I only got this yesterday, but, and I probably have to give it back, but you know, maybe if I do a really good video, they'll let me keep it. Um, but I thought we'd talk about, you know, what, why has it got four things on it? You know, how does this relate to, for example, the Kinect that everyone knows famously that was one of the first things to do this? And what's new and interesting about this kind of technology? Well, let's demo it first, right? So I've got my Intel RealSense viewer here. I've made almost no effort, right? So I haven't installed the SDK. I'm not using this with code, although you can do this. I'm just going to turn on the stereo camera. And now it's booted up. You can actually see it's pretty good, right? I mean, you know, when you get closer, yeah, that's working. It's working. That's not bad. I can see, I can see the microphone and the, I've got my hand in the way now. Um, and then you're behind it over here and you can just generally see that there's a kind of wall behind you that's kind of the the shape that I would expect. If I turn on the camera as well, you can see that this is kind of what the scene is looking at. There's Sean. So, I mean, it works pretty well. Now, people who are expecting a perfect depth map might be surprised that there's a little bit of missing stuff here. Perhaps we can talk a bit about the technology. Stereo is in some sense a solved problem in the sense that this is very good, right? Very fast. It's never going to be perfect, right? And there's a few reasons for this. Mostly it comes down to essentially, you can't see everything with both eyes. And so, you know, on the left here, there's a huge gap and that's because the right camera can't see that bit of the scene. And so we can't resolve any kind of depth there. It's the same thing of when you hold your finger up and you actually see two fingers, right? If I'm looking at you and I'm looking at my finger, through my finger, I can see two fingers. You kind of ignore that because you're used to it, but those things appear as artifacts in this kind of image. So how does this work? Well, I'll turn it off. Um, So what we've got is we've got four sensors on here. These two are cameras here, um, the left camera and the right camera. Right. I am, that is correct, it's just because they're from my point of view, not from your point of view. Right. This is an IR dot pattern emitter, which just splashes dot pattern, and we'll talk about that. And then this is the actual RGB camera. Right. Now what, the whole point of the real sense is that it does RGBD. So it, will, it knows where these cameras are on its PCB, it's been calibrated, and that means when it produces a depth uh, map, it can also attach RGB values to those exact pixels. Right, by knowing where this sits compared to these. Now, we talked about stereo in a different video and it was about matching between images. In general, the idea of stereo is you have some pixels in your left image, for example, and you try and find the corresponding position in your right image and you use triangulation to work out then how far away they are. Now, in this setup, that's a lot easier because these cameras are fixed, they're very well calibrated and essentially they're level with each other. So. Basically, the algorithm just needs to look where you are on the left and look left and right in the right image until it finds the corresponding matching feature and work out the depth. And it does that with respect to the left image. So it goes, it starts in the left image, find for all pixels, it looks in the right image to find out which pixels um, correspond to them and then what the depth is. And it will also be doing some stuff to do with smoothing and things like that. Generally, I mean, we mentioned this in the stereo video, but generally, scenes like your camera has got a lot of different depths but this wall doesn't right and so it can produce smoother things on the wall right this is not an interesting wall um, i should put some artwork up or something anyway so what does this dot pattern do well one of the problems with stereo is that you need features to match you need to be able to say okay i found these pixels that look like this and in the right image they're over here but if your pixels are all a white wall that becomes really quite difficult to do 
And so what the Connect introduced was this IR dot pattern. So essentially you can, you, can, you can see pictures of this online with people who've got IR sensitive cameras looking at this, but it just splashes a sort of semi-random, pseudo-random pattern of dots over everything. And the Connect directly used that to work out what the depth was based on the warping of those dots. So you'd see the pattern obviously differently on a flat surface to a curved yeah. surface. Yes, and, and, and for example, if the pattern looks small and far away, it, it's small and far away, <laughs> like, something like that, right? That the pattern is, a, is, a, is a, of a known structure, and so when that structure changes, you can say, okay, that's because of the depth. This is not quite the same as this. This uses the infrared as an optional additional texture that can help but it's not mandatory, right? So what that means is that this ca these cameras see both the scene, but also a load of dot pattern that's put everywhere, if it's there, and they can use that to say, okay, I, I definitely am pretty sure that even on this white wall, these two positions match, right? And we can see this actually, uh, if I plug this back in. So if I put this in here, right? So this looks pretty good. What this is now using stereo matching between both images, and it's also using the infrared dot pattern to provide additional texture. If I cover up one of the cameras, we lose the depth, obviously, right? It's just a camera now, it doesn't work. If I take the camera back, it, it comes back in, right? It's quite robust actually, it didn't, it didn't crash. Anything I'd have written to do this would have horribly broken. Um, if I cover up the infrared dot pattern, which I'm sort of guessing where that is, it's over here, right? Then you can see that the depth still works, but it's much, much worse than it was before. And that's because now we only have the two cameras we're just doing the best we can with what we've got. So areas like you, where you've got quite a lot of texture, are still actually pretty good, right? It's worse, but it's not bad. The wall over there, which is essentially plain white, has basically started to completely fail over here on the corner because there's nothing really of interest on that wall. If I take my finger off, we can see suddenly it's much, much, much better because on this white wall, this infrared pattern is really, really helping, right? So this is what makes this quite a cool little device is, it, first of all, it doesn't crash when I cover up one of the cameras, which I like, right? just as the software engineer in me thinks that's good, but it's optional, right? So some of the real sensors don't have an infrared emitter, but this one has this optional infrared emitter where if it works, it can help. If it doesn't work, you get some depth back. Outside, infrared is much less effective. You can imagine against the sun, this dot pattern is essentially not visible. So when you're outside, you're gonna fall back to normal stereo vision. The other thing to mention is that no processing is being done on my laptop at all. Right, so my laptop, the fans aren't spinning up, it's having to display this on the screen, but it's not having to work very hard. And that's because all of the stereo matching, all of the use of infrared and all of the RGB you know, alignment is being done on this device, right? which of course is exactly what we want. Right? And that was actually one of the first things that Connect did. Right? And, then, and, and since then, all these other devices that do much the same thing. Because if you have to use one of your cores on your computer to do the actual matching, then suddenly that matching is going to slow down when your computer's under load. It's just a complete pain. It's nice to have a camera that just gives you a depth sensing without having to do a load of extra work to get it. Right? There are, of course, other depth sensing technologies like LiDAR, time of flight lasers, and things like this, which are perhaps arguably more accurate, more expensive. I mentioned that deep learning, for example, will be better in uh, RGBD. So you actually, it's quite common. So for example, so one of the things we're looking at um, is uh, object saliency, which is how you know, where are the important objects in an image. And in object saliency, there are various data sets, but there are also RGBD data sets, which are essentially the same, but they also have depth information. And it depends on how the data set was captured. And actually, this is true of a lot of fields where you've got some data sets in RGB, some data sets in RGBD, and you know, the techniques for RGBD, as you imagine, are pretty similar, right? They might vary slightly. So for example, if you've got a normal three channel image, then if you remember what you put into a deep network, you would normally have RGB and we represent these as planes of image. Now, actually, of course, thinking back to one of my first videos, maybe my first video on how digital images are stored, if I can remember that, 255 would be the most of that color that the camera's seen. A much younger version of me, we actually store them pixel-wise, RG and B, as little bytes within the pixel. But we don't do that when we put them into deep networks. We put them in as three channels of input like this, R, G, and B, or BGR, or whatever. Right? Now, this goes into the first layer of your network and is convolved using a convolution and so on. Right? It goes through your network. And so your network would do some, some convolutions and some filtering, and then it would make some sort of decision, produce some kind of segmentation, or whatever your downstream task actually is, or your, obje or your objective. Now, in RGBD, it's exactly the same. We just have an extra channel. So we have R, G, B, D. So this is our depth map, and then R, G, and B. 
that's not a B. And you can put this into a network and just you know, run it as normal, right? The network, in, in some sense, doesn't care that you've got th four channels, not three. You just have to change the first layer. So actually, what you do is you have an identical network where you just reconfigure this very first layer to take an input of four instead of an input of three. And that will require retraining, but it's not a big task to do this. Right? And you might find that if you do that, you, you have some kind of performance improvement, right? With the caveat that you've got to have gone then had a real sense or some other camera capture this additional data, right? So you'll find that people do this when it's necessary to do this or useful to do this, not just because why not capture depth, right? There is some, <laughs> there is some headache in doing so. Also, the depth map might be bad, right? We saw when the infrared drops down, it, it gets less good. This is true outside. When there's areas of poor texture, it's worth bearing in mind. Now, some techniques separate the depth from RGB. So what they would do is they would have an RGB uh, pathway like this, and then they have a separate D pathway like this, which does some processing, and maybe they join these together for some kind of decision making. Right? And that's also quite common. So the reason you might do this is if you think that the depth is in some way, it some way needs to be treated separately to the RGB because it represents some different data, that might be what you do. Right? It's that kind of idea. But you can see it intuitively, not difficult to build depth information into a deep network or into any image processing uh, pipeline and you usually get a bit of a boost in performance. Giving it a depth channel, even though technically these mean something different, not really that important. As long as you train it appropriately, it doesn't really matter. You might find some performance benefit of keeping it separate for a while or some other strategy, but in some sense, there's no harm in doing it. Right? The, it's not, this, they used to be quite expensive stereo setups or difficult to configure. Now, this comes out of the box, I plugged it in and it immediately returned me a depth map. There was no calibration, there was no faffing about, someone must have calibrated it in the factory, I guess. So, I was surprised actually, I thought it would work worse than it did. It worked really, really well. And so theoretically, it's just, there's no big headache for me to just to use this. It produces RGB as well, so I can stream this directly and put it into my deep learning algorithms. And it's not an expensive device, it's, you know, the order of a few hundred pounds for these kind of devices, maybe less. And so that's sort of consumer budget you could see that it might be something that people could actually buy and make use of. As a quantum bit, so it's not just zero or one, it can be a mixture of zero and one. So what we have is this and this, and we have some mixture, we have some superposition. Even machine A and C can't see or hear each other, they can't sort of pick up each other's transmissions.